Hello everybody and welcome to lecture one for our microbiology course this series. Um, this is going to cover kind of an introduction to microbiology, kind of what microbiology is, um, a little bit of the history of microbiology, kind of where microbiology is headed, some of the big breakthroughs of microbiology, um, and a little bit of introduction to what a microbe is and kind of how it classifies them. So let's go ahead and get started with that. So first off, we need to ask ourselves, what is microbiology? Um, why are we in this course? Why do we care about microbes? So let's go ahead and get started with that. So first off, what is microbiology? Well, it's a study of things that you can't see with your naked eye, and that makes perfect sense if you think about it. Um, things that are very small, very tiny, you can't see them with your naked eye, um, so you have to have some sort of tool or device to help you see them. Um, this is going to be things like bacteria that you're probably very familiar with, E. coli, salmonella, things like fungi, um, yeast, uh, things like um, ringworm, probably familiar with that one. Some of that you're probably not so familiar with, like algae. Um, there can be things like big seaweed and kelp that you're familiar with, um, but things that you're not so familiar with, like these little guys right here called volvox, um, very small microscopic algae species. Um, there are a couple of other algae species out there that can cause diseases in humans and animals that are microscopic, so very small. Um, and then a couple of little weird things out there um, that you're probably familiar with, like viruses that aren't really living, just kind of weird little um, organisms. Um, and then a couple that you're probably not so familiar with, things like helmets, you've probably heard of them before, um, pinworms, um, tapeworms, things like that, worms, um, parasites that live inside of animals and humans. Um, now, you don't really think about those being microbes because they're quite large. Um, but their larval forms and their egg forms, how they transmit, are microscopic. So that's going to be a little more what we're looking at in the microscopic world. Um, so they're transmittable forms, the eggs and the larvae and things like that. Um, and then you've got some things like prions, which are kind of a misfolded proteins, kind of screwed up proteins that we'll talk about a little later on. Um, that are just kind of weird. Um, and then there's all kinds of other stuff out there um, in between. The, the ones that I mentioned that people study that are tiny that uh, you need a microscope to see. Um, so anything that's in that world of tiny things that you can't see with your naked eye is going to be considered a microbe um, that can be studied by a microbiologist. Now most microbiologists aren't going to necessarily study everything. Um, they're not going to be an expert in fungi, bacteria, algae, viruses, everything on the planet. Um, so most of them tend to just specialize in something. They'll pick like a bacteriologist or a mycologist, someone who studies fungi, a phycologist, someone who studies algae, a virologist, so on and so forth. So most people will just pick um, one particular field, um, and that's what they'll focus on, and that's what they'll study um, and do their research on. So why do we need to be interested in microbiology? Why is this something that we care about? Um, why do we need to study it? Um, well, microbes are invisible. We can't see them. Um, but... Compared to everything else on the planet, war included, um, natural disasters, all kinds of stuff, um, microbes have killed far more people than all of that stuff combined. Um, they're tiny, they're invisible, you can't even see them, um, and they kill thousands and thousands of people every year and billions of people throughout history. Uh, now, the first recorded history of uh, microbes in use in biological warfare was by the Mongols. You can see them up here. Uh, in the corner, this is a Turkish uh, manuscript where the Mongolians, you can see them here, they're launching bodies that were killed by the plague over the walls of a city that they're trying to take over. Um, so people understood that you could get sick from dead bodies, um, you could get sick from things a long time ago, but they didn't really understand what was going on. Um, they kind of just thought it was some sort of force that maybe get made you sick or maybe the air was bad. Um, but they didn't really understand that it was a living organism um, per se, that was making you sick. They just didn't understand that part. They couldn't see it. Um, they didn't have a way to see them, so it just didn't make sense that there was something out there that they couldn't see that could make you sick. Um, so, um, even fast forward into the American Civil War, um, you can see the picture down there in the bottom uh, right. We had regiments of 20, 30,000 men, and I think I read somewhere that you know, like 20 or 30 percent of the, the casualties would be lost to the battlefield and somewhere it's upward like 45 to 50 percent of the casualties to the unit um, would be lost to diseases. Um, so far more people died from just uh, typhus and all kinds of transmissible diseases in these uh, army get barrack camps um, than they did from being shot on the battlefield. Um, so infections and things have killed far more people um, and just imagine what could have uh, been if these people didn't die from such simple things. 
Um, but fast forward through time and sanitation levels have gotten a whole lot better. We've figured out how to kind of treat a lot of these diseases. Um, but they still pose a threat to us in modern day times. Things like HIV, Ebola, the flu, the coronavirus that we're dealing with now. All kinds of stuff um, pose a threat to humans that are microbiologically related. Um, so once again, why do we need to care about microbiology? What does microbiology do for humans other than try to kill us? Well, a couple of cool things. It makes vaccines. Um, vaccines are produced via um, microbes a lot of times, um, or with the aid of microbes, and we have to combat the microbes that are trying to kill us with vaccines. That's a pretty good thing. Um, lots of our food, alcohol, um, beer, uh, yeast, bread, cheeses, yogurts, all that kind of stuff is produced by uh, living organisms, microbes. Um, you see a boat on our screen, what does that have to do with microbiology? Well, if you were a person living in Europe in the 13, 14, 1500s, um, and you needed to take a travel, a voyage from place to place, and you needed to go onto a boat, you have to take your fresh water with you. You can't drink the ocean water. Well, unfortunately, the best way you have to put water on a boat is in a barrel, um, a wooden barrel. And those wooden barrels full of fresh water would last maybe about a week or so, um, and then they would get really funky and rancid and you couldn't drink them. They weren't safe to drink anymore. So if you needed to take a voyage over about a week, you really couldn't do that safely um, with water on your boat. So how did they get around this problem? How did they get to America? How did they get to the New World? How did they get all around the globe when they couldn't take water for more than a week? Well, the answer to that was to take pretty much pure alcohol along with them. Really, really, really strong beer. Um, and beer is produced, alcohol, um, produced by fungi. So what they would do is they would take about half the amount of water that they needed and half the amount of beer that they needed, um, and they would mix them half and half, uh, one barrel and one barrel, or half a glass, or whatever, half a glass, and mix them together. Um, and the alcohol would dilute the water and kill all the microbes inside of it, and the water would dilute the alcohol to make it drinkable, so you wouldn't get totally trashed and then fall off the side of the ship. Um, so. Once they figured this concept out, it allowed people to travel a lot farther because the alcohol wouldn't go bad on the ship. It would just stay sterile. The alcohol would kill everything inside of it. Nothing would grow. Um, and then you could dilute the water um, and keep the water for a lot longer. Um, and then you'll see uh, the song by the Hollies, um, 60s, 50s, or 60s band, sorry, um, with Graham Nash from Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, if you know who they are. Um, it was his first band, but they sang the song called The Air That I Breathe, and bacteria and uh, if, uh, other microbes like uh, algae and uh, cyanobacteria produce upwards of about 40 to 50 percent of the air that we breathe on a daily basis. Uh, most people think of plants being our photosynthetic organisms out there, um, but lots of our oxygen is actually produced by microbes, um, algae or cyanobacteria. And these organisms were the very first types of uh, organisms to evolve photosynthesis on the planet, very primitive form of photosynthesis, but it does produce oxygen. Um, so way back in early Earth, these were the organisms that first evolved, um, that could produce oxygen, that uh, produced enough oxygen to allow organisms to travel onto land. So these guys made the oxygen for the early Earth's environment. Um, and then finally, you can see they kill us, and that's not a particularly great thing that they do for humanity. But if we can figure out how to keep them from killing us, it's a pretty nice thing. Um, so, why do we need to care about microbiologists? We went over that. Well, what does a microbiologist do um, in modern day times? Well, there are lots of things that microbiologists can do. Here are just a couple of the fields um, of modern day microbiology, of public health and epidemiology. Now, this is going to be a really important field. Um, especially as the human population grows, antibiotics become harder to um, administer properly and they quit working, um, as it, um, resistance grows. Uh, but these people will go out into communities and work with the local government, state governments, uh, maybe national governments, um, and they will work to control and monitor the spread of contagious diseases. Um, so given the coronavirus, these people are out there testing people, monitoring the uh, testing sites, making sure they have what they need, um, testing people, um, uh, registering results, making sure that the outbreaks are being monitored at the hospitals properly and things like that, um, and reporting all of this data back um, and then collecting it and figuring out where the high spots are, where the low spots are, and things like that, and how to direct resources around. So very, very, very important um, field of microbiology to make sure that we're keeping people and our citizens safe. Um, and then you've got biotechnology. Now this is a pretty cool field of microbiology. This one can be anywhere from uh, someone having a craft brewery where they brew beer 
um, or all the way up to stem cell research where you're making a, a, a brand new organ for someone in a lab. So these people um, are going to use living organisms to do something for humanity, to uh, produce something that we want, um, to produce some sort of product that we like, aka beer, um, or aka a liver, a brand new liver. Um, so biotechnology has countless uh, things out there. We can make bacteria do all kinds of useful things. Um, pretty neat field, uh, countless uh, ends to, to go into if you want to become a biotechnologist. Um, and then there's environmental microbiology, um, which are people who look at the relationship between the environment and the microbes that live there. Um, it makes sense if you think about it that everything we do, if we pour pesticides or sewage or agricultural runoff or anything like that onto water or onto ground or on the soil, that the organisms that live there, microbiologically speaking, will be impacted some way or another. Um, either they're going to grow a lot because they got a lot of nutrients or they're not going to grow at all. Um, it'll kill them or it may make one population grow and kill another one. Um, so anything that can throw off the balance of the ecosystem um, is going to have an impact down the line somewhere, somehow. Um, so these people will go in and figure out how to clean up these spills. Um, if you have, a, if you remember the oil spill in, from the BP in the Gulf of Mexico, um, I had a professor that worked in grad school that developed uh, bacteria that ate um, petroleum, um, and they went in and released them into the Gulf of Mexico to eat the petroleum, and that's what these people would do. Very cool field of study. And then you've got immunology. Um, and these are people that are going to work with the immune system and how the immune system interacts with microbes. Um, these people would be developing new vaccines, um, making allergy tests, or um, uh, figuring out how to, uh, to blood type um, and things like that. Figuring out how the immune system interacts and how to prevent um, or alter the interactions with the, uh, with the microbes that we come in contact with with the immune system. So very cool, um, very, very, very important field of microbiology. And then you've got the genetic engineering, uh, everybody's favorite, where we actually go in and tinker with the genes of organisms um, to create new genetically modified organisms that can do new and novel things. Um, so insulin is produced by E. coli. Uh, they don't naturally produce insulin. Um, they are engineered to do that. Um, we have gone in and inserted the gene for human insulin inside of a bacteria and, uh, and triggered them to produce insulin for us. Um, so that's a pretty cool use of genetic engineering. All kinds of endless, endless possibilities for genetic engineering. Very, very, very cool um, field of microbiological research. Microbes are, grow very quickly. Um, they're easy to take care of for the most part. You can grow a lot of them in a very small space. Um, and they're really easy to work with. So they're perfect um, organisms to work with for genetic engineering. Um, then we've got agricultural microbiology. Um, and if you have ever eaten a uh, farmed, uh, not, not that you farmed, but a, a bought, a store-bought uh, piece of meat or a store-bought piece of plant or uh, vegetables or fruit or something like that, um, it's been through the hands of some sort of agricultural microbiologist at some point. Um, they've looked at either the living organisms that were harvested from meat to the bacteria that live inside of them. They get sick as well. Um, just like we do, so you have to treat them with antibiotics. You have to make sure that the bacteria that they're coming in contact with uh, aren't becoming immune to the antibiotics that you use. Um, you have to make sure that the antibiotics aren't being transmitted to their meat and building up and transmitted to humans and things like that. So all kinds of very interesting fields in that. Um, plants get sick as well. They have viruses. Um, plants have bacteria that impact them too. How to treat those and making sure that the soil that the plants are growing in doesn't have um, you know, fecal runoff or that the bacteria that are in there pro are producing the right amount of nitrogen and things like that for the soil. It's a very, very interesting field of microbiology. Um, and then the last one is going to be food microbiologists. Um, so if you eat any sort of processed food, candy bars, dog food for your animals, um, anything that's ever been processed by a human hand other than literally just picked up and put down on the table like a fruit maybe, um, is going to come in contact with a food microbiologist at some point in time. Um, even things like beauty products like toothpaste or lotion or shampoo and things have uh, run across these people as well. Um, so food microbiologists work at every food processing plant across the, the world or at least our country. 
Um, and their job is to go in and test the food products as well as the production facilities um, to make sure that they're not contaminated, that they're clean to the right levels, um, that they're being taken care of and maintained properly so no one gets sick um, or contaminated from the production facility. Um, so you don't want to have beef that's being produced, ground beef that's got E. coli inside of it that makes the end user sick. Um, so you have to test the meat itself to make sure that there's no E. coli in the meat. You also have to test the uh, production facility, all the knives, all the uh, uh, slides, all the packaging equipment and stuff to make sure that it's not contaminated as well. Um, so that's their job is to go make sure that everything's clean, properly sanitized, um, and not contaminated. So countless fields of study for microbiologists, um, tons of things that could, uh, if you piqued your interest, um, to look into. So what are some things that microbiologists will study? Um, I mentioned a few of them earlier, um, but there really is no definitive line of what is considered a microbe and what's really not. It's just things that you can't really see with your naked eye. Um, and once again, that line gets blurry when we talk about things like worms, because the adult worms are you know, you can see them. Um, the tiny little larval forms and the eggs are not. Um, so is the organism whole? Eh, it gets murky. Um, so there really isn't really a definitive line of what a microbiologist studies and what they don't. Um, but generally, you're going to study every single prokaryotic organism on the planet. That includes bacteria um, and, and archaic organisms. Um, and that's what you're going to study. Um, as well as a few generally accepted microbes that are eukaryotic. Now we'll talk about what the difference between a prokaryote and a eukaryote is in a little bit. Um, but that just has to do with how their cells are put together. One's a little more complicated than the other. Um, but the couple of the eukaryotes, other than all the bacteria that microbiologists will study, are going to be yeast. Um, you can see our yeast right here. These are going to be um, budding yeast cells that produce uh, things like beer for us, alcohol, produce um, CO2 for baking, um, causing uh, the carbonation in beer and things like that. So very, very, very useful things. They also cause lots of infections, yeast infections um, as well. Um, you can see our algae here. Algae is super cool. Um, a couple of these guys cause disease. Mostly they're really good at making oxygen. They're little tiny uh, microscopic little tiny plants that are capable of photosynthesis um, and they will produce oxygen for us. They're not really plants but uh, kind of a weird little classification. They can, they're kind of sort of plants but not really. Um, and then we've got our protist here. And protists are very interesting little organisms. They are all eukaryotic. Um, they're not prokaryotes, we'll talk about what that means in a little bit, but they're kind of in between animals and plants. They do some really weird things, they might be photosynthetic, but it works in a different way, or they might have a um, chloroplast to be able to make photosynthetic products, but they don't use it. Um, they're just kind of weird, so they do some strange things. So we don't really know if it's a plant or an animal, it's a protist. It gets kind of just tossed in the protist file. Um, and then our last one are going to be our helminths up here. Um, the worms, things like tapeworms, pinworms, um, hookworms, all the strange little parasites that animals and humans get. Um, it looks kind of like a, uh, um, a little star-nosed mole, if you've ever seen one of those, um, but those are actually just hooks. It's called scolex, um, and those little hooks will burrow into the side of the intestines of the organism that that uh, parasite has decided to uh, live inside or gotten inside of. Um, and those little hooks will allow it to attach to the side of the intestines where it can feed um, off the organism's digested food. So are just uh, you know, very strange little organisms. Um, so other than all the bacteria that come along with being a microbiologist, um, these are going to be the few eukaryotes um, that are tossed into the microbiology world as well. So along with our couple of eukaryotes, um, our bacteria and things like that, our prokaryotes, there are a couple of non-living things um, that are called infectious agents um, that microbiologists study as well. So if it's not living, um, how does it make you sick? Um, well, we'll talk about that later on in this course. Very interesting way that these organisms, or not organisms, they're not living, that these uh, infectious agents do this. Now you're probably familiar with viruses. Um, they're not living organisms, which is why antibiotics do not work on them. Anti-life, antibiotic, anti-life. Um, viruses aren't living, so antibiotics don't work on them. So if you get the common cold or the flu, antibiotics aren't going to do anything for you. Uh, viruses are a piece of DNA or RNA 
um, surrounded by a little ball of protein. And that's essentially all they are. They don't make uh, products, cellular products. They can't reproduce by themselves. They really can't do anything other than just kind of transmit around and make you sick. Um, and some of them don't even do that, uh, make you sick. So very odd little organisms. Um, and the next one is called a virioid. Now, these mostly just impact plants. Um, and it's a tiny little piece of RNA that somehow is able to cause infection in plants. A very strange little thing. Um, we'll talk about those later as well. And our last one's going to be a prion. Now, proteins, um, they do things for cells. They act as enzymes. They act as structural support. They help the cell do things. Um, and a prion is a broken protein. And when the protein gets broken, we don't understand how this happens. It seems to just happen randomly in people and organisms. Um, when a prion becomes broken, uh, or if a protein becomes broken, um, it can sometimes turn into a prion. Uh, most of the time when they break, they just fall apart. They don't work anymore. But sometimes they break in just the right way that it can fold into a prion, become a broken prion. Um, now when it does that, that prion, instead of just falling away and becoming a useless blob of broken protein and being digested by the cell, that prion maintains some ability to do things. Um, and what it does is it can hijack other proteins. Um, so it leaves its post holding, um, you know, your brain supports or the cells inside of you, the nerves inside of your brain, it leaves its post holding those in place. Um, and then it goes and finds another structural support protein and says, hey, come on with me, let's go do something else. So it recruits another protein. Um, that leaves its place and becomes a prion. Um, and then eventually what happens is all the prions inside of your head have convinced all the other proteins to leave their post and become uh, prions as well. And then eventually you have no structural support inside of your brain where the proteins are leaving from and your brain just kind of turns to mush because nothing's holding it together anymore. Um, and if you've ever heard of uh, mad cow disease or bovine spongiform encephalopathy, um, spongiform refers to the sponge look of the brain after all the little holes inside of it after the proteins leave their post. Um, so it just kind of melts your brain and turns your brain to mush. Um, so you just die very slow, very prolonged, kind of you know, just wasting away death um, as your brain just kind of slowly melts thanks to prions. Very highly contagious, very, very odd little organisms. Uh, very rare though. Um, so, once again, I've mentioned microbes are things that you can't see with your naked eye. So what do we really see and can't see with our naked eye? And kind of where do we really draw the line? Once again, it's kind of a blur. Um, but this is kind of the accepted scale of the microbiological world. Where do the microbes kind of come into play? Um, and where do, where do microscopes really come into play and things like that? Um, so as you can see on one end over here on our far right, we have an adult female. And then on the other far left, we have an atom, the world's smallest, simplest thing. Um, so everywhere in between, we have things uh, ranging from the ostrich egg over there near our adult female, which is the world's largest single cell. Um, very interesting uh, thing. They get around the problem of uh, cells being too big, if you uh, recall that anywhere from Biology 1, um, with the fact that it's a giant self-contained uh, picnic basket. It's got a lot of food with it, so they can get away with that. Um, then you have chicken egg below that, and frog eggs. And then right underneath frog eggs, um, you have the human egg. And the human egg sits right about on the end of you being able to see it with your naked eye. You can kind of sort of make it out. It's about the size of a grain of salt. Um, so you can kind of sort of see it. Um, it's not super big, not super, uh, not super microscopic, but you can kind of almost see it. So that's not really considered a microbe yet or, or something that a microbiologist would study. And then right underneath that, you're going to get the average human uh, cell, the average animal cell, the average plant cell. And that's where um, our microbiology is going to really come into play here. Um, Frog egg, if you want to look at that, a human egg microscope's going to help. You'll be able to see some of the features inside, um, but you can't see an animal cell and a plant cell without your microscope. You just can't do it. They're too small. Um, so those guys are going to be our main focus of microbiology. Anything smaller than that um, and anything between that uh, virus and that animal cell um, is going to be really where we're going to be hitting our sweet spot for this course. So animal cells and plant cells are both around the same size, and underneath that we have mitochondria and bacteria. Now you'll notice bacteria and mitochondria are about the same size. Um, that's not a coincidence. Um, bacteria are essentially just 
mitochondria and mitochondria are essentially just bacteria that live inside of animal cells. Um, we'll get into a little bit of that later on. It's called the endosymbiotic theory. A uh, very cool little theory of how uh, eukaryotic cells originated um, on the planet. So down below our mitochondria and our bacteria, we have our flu virus getting smaller than that. Um, and then you're going to get into things that you're going to need specialized microscopes to really see. Um, the average microscope that we have um, in most research facilities and most hospitals and things like that can almost barely make out viruses. Not really. You can't really see them at all. Um, but you can see bacteria. You can see animal cells very well. Um, so if you really want to visualize a virus, you're going to need a specialized type of microscope um, to allow you to get in to see those. Um, and if you want to see anything smaller than that, like the proteins or the lipid structures, the carbohydrates that actually make up these organisms and these uh, infectious agents, you're going to need those specialized microscopes as well because they're just too small. So let's go ahead and talk about the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic. I've mentioned that a bunch. What does that mean? Um, so first off, let's talk about what a cell is and when cells showed up on the planet. Um, so a cell is essentially just the most simplistic form of life on the planet. Um, a living organism has to have five characteristics of life. It has to be able to reproduce by itself. Um, it has to be able to carry out the uh, metabolism, make its own energy, um, so on and so forth. And a cell is the smallest living organism that's capable of doing that. It's most simplistic, I should say. They're not necessarily small, simplistic. Um, that's capable of doing all of those traits. Now, I'm a big complex organism. Um, I can do all of those traits as myself. But every single individual cell inside of me can also do those, in, uh, those traits as well. It can make its own energy. It can reproduce by itself. Um, so it's capable of sustaining its own life as well as my own. Now, individual cells, single-celled organisms, um, can do all of that stuff just by their single cell. They don't need to live in a big cell uh, colony, a big organism to do that. Um, they can do that all by themselves. So cells um, and things that microbiologists will look at, like bacteria, kind of have been around for about 3.5 billion years or so on this planet. Um, there's a little evidence to show that they've been around maybe a little earlier than that, maybe about 4.1, about 4.2 billion years. But the first solid evidence, you can see it here, this is a bacterial fossil, it's kind of like a stack of quarters, um, was found, that dates back to about 3.5 billion years ago. And I don't know how anybody found that, it's extremely small. Um, but they've been around on our planet for about 3.5 billion years. Now, there are two main different types of cells. There's a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell. Now, what does that mean? Now, prokaryotic, you can see that here. Um, the prefix pro means pre or before. Um, and karyotic just means nucleus. Um, so a cell that's considered prokaryotic, um, it means it does not have a nucleus. It's a cell that's pre-nucleus, which means it's very simplistic, very small, um, very similar to what would have been found in this type of fossil. These are prokaryotic cells. Um, very similar to the very first types of cells to evolve on the planet. Um, its new DNA just floats around freely inside of the cytoplasm, um, and so on and so forth. Very simplistic organism. And then we have our eukaryotic cells, um, which have a true nucleus. Use the Greek prefix for true, karyotic meaning nucleus, so true nucleus. Um, all bacterial cells on the planet um, are going to be considered prokaryotic. They all have the same traits. They're all very simplistic, no nucleus. Um, while as there are a couple of algae um, considered cyanobacteria that are going to be considered prokaryotic as well. And the archaebacteria, archaea, um, that are going to be lumped into the prokaryotic category as well. Now, if you don't have a microscope, um, and you, or sorry, if you just have a microscope, um, and you don't have any chemical test, you can't get into their DNA, you can't ask somebody that knows what they are, nothing else, and all you have is a microscope, and you have two cells that are sitting on a microscope, how do you tell if it's prokaryotic or eukaryotic? Um, well, if you've looked at a bunch of them, it's pretty easy, but if you have two cells that look like this, one of them's giant, and one of them is teeny, teeny, tiny compared to it, the teeny, teeny, tiny one is going to be your prokaryotic cell most of the time. Animal cells are huge, um, eukaryotic cells, plant cells, they're huge. Prokaryotic cells are very, very, very small. So 
that's the easiest way to tell the two apart if you have no other ability to do so other than just look at them underneath a microscope. Um, your eukaryotes are going to be significantly larger um, than your prokaryotes underneath a microscope. So it's the easiest kind of way to tell the two cells apart if you don't have any other test. So um, along with that difference of the size, um, getting into the insides, what's really going on in there that makes them different um, is the presence or absence of a nucleus. Now that karyote means nucleus, pro means before, you means true. So what is a nucleus? Well, first off, we've got to talk about what the DNA inside of the cell is useful for. The DNA, as you probably are well aware of, um, is how organisms transmit around um, their uh, hereditable information, how they make new versions of themselves. Um, so you have to keep that protected. Well, prokaryotes are really, really, really small. Um, their DNA sits in, they're very small, DNA gets in the middle of a very small little ball, and they'll stay nicely protected. Um, it doesn't really have to worry about, um, you know, getting lost inside of the cell um, or anything like that. There's not a lot of space for it to get lost, and it's kind of like getting lost in a closet. Well, as eukaryotes, on the other hand, um, they're really big. So if your DNA just floats around inside of you, um, it's going to get lost inside of your giant mansion very quickly. So you want to make sure that all your DNA stays in one nice, compacted, little safe space. Um, so they ball it off in a little membrane-bound ball, a phospholipid's called a nucleus, just to kind of keep everything safe. Um, and that's going to make sure that the DNA doesn't get damaged, um, doesn't get lost, and make sure that everything's in one nice, compact spot um, when the cell is ready to use it. And so that's the real main difference between the two. There are a bunch of other cellular differences in there, um, but the big main difference, other than just the size, is the presence or absence of that nucleus. So prokaryotes don't have it so much smaller, they don't have to worry about it. Whereas our eukaryotes, they need that nucleus to keep their DNA safe because they're a whole lot bigger, um, lots of chances for it to get damaged, um, and things like that. So let's talk about some of the individual traits of a prokaryote, kind of what makes a prokaryote a prokaryote, and what's unique to prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. Um, so if you're a prokaryote, you are always going to be unicellular. There are no multicellular um, prokaryotes out there. They may live in a colony, they may live in a blob, but they don't need their partners to do anything else. That cell, if you removed it out of that colony and stuck it by itself, it would live perfectly fine by itself. They don't need... Um, other cells to make uh, the, the, to be able to reproduce to make energy. They don't need other cells to do that. They're perfectly capable of doing it by themselves. Um, and they're all microscopic. It's another characteristic of prokaryotes. There are no um, macroscopic that you can see with your naked eye bacteria. They just aren't. They're too small. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they lack that membrane-bound nucleoid. They just don't have it. Or uh, that membrane-bound nucleus. Excuse me. They just don't have it. Um, but what they do have is a little blob of DNA. It sticks together just because of the charge. Um, they're attracted to each other. It just sticks together like a little uh, yarn ball. Um, and that's sometimes called a bacterial chromosome or a nucleoid. Um, and that's just a little blob, a ball of DNA that kind of slowly freaks, floats around, uh, freely floats around inside of the cell. It's a very interesting um, way to maintain the <laughs> DNA inside of yourself. Just kind of let it float around. Um, they don't have organelles inside of them, they don't have mitochondria, they don't have chloroplasts, they are bacteria, mitochondria, they are chloroplast. They don't have Golgi apparatus and things like that, they have everything they need inside of them as their single cell. They don't need organelles to do that uh, stuff for them. Um, now they have cell walls, not every single cell on the planet is going to have a cell wall. Animal cells lack them, plant cells have them, fungus have them, bacteria, prokaryotes have them. Um, but what makes those cell walls up is going to be different for each phylum. And that's going to be one of the characteristics that classifies an organism as what phylum it's in. Now prokaryotes, um, their cell walls, not every prokaryote has one, but the vast majority of them do. Um, and if they do have one, it's going to be made up, for the most part, of something called peptidoglycan. Um, a very unique, um, you can see there, peptido meaning protein, glycan meaning sugar. Um, protein, sugar, little combination that makes up their cell walls. Now that's only found in prokaryotes. There's no eukaryote on the planet, that I'm aware of anyway, um, that can produce peptidoglycan naturally. So that makes it a wonderful target for antibiotics. The vast majority of antibiotics uh, that you're probably familiar with work on targeting things that are found only in 
the prokaryotic cell and not in a eukaryotic cell. So it just kills the bacteria that we were, that's making us sick and not us. And peptidoglycan is one of those wonderful targets, only found in prokaryotes and not us. Um, they almost always reproduce asexually by binary fission. There you go. One bacteria makes an identical copy of its DNA and splits into two identical copies of itself. Very, very, very simple. Um, they have ribosomes just like eukaryotes, but the ribosome that's inside of them is considered something called a 70S ribosome. Now it does the same thing as our ribosomes. It makes proteins pretty much in the exact same way, but it's smaller. And that's what the difference is. It's a smaller ribosome compared to ours. It's slightly, um, slightly smaller, and then hence the uh, 70S part. Um, 70S, S refers to sped barge, which is how fast the centrifuge spins around. Um, doesn't matter. It's kind of an irrelevant measurement for you, but just for your information. Um, so you can see down here a little graph of some of the things that prokaryotes and eukaryotes share in common um, and the differences between them. So um, our prokaryotes, there are two different branches or domains um, of prokaryotes. Now, um, life um, is kind of the overall arching term, kind of like saying vehicle. And if I say the word vehicle, that could be anything from a train to a plane to an automobile um, to a submarine. So you kind of have to narrow that down a little bit. Um, so when I say the word life, it doesn't really help. So we can narrow the chain down, or vehicle, down into categories like trains or planes or automobiles. Now, as you well know, there are lots of different types of trains, lots of different types of cars, but at least it takes out a lot of those other categories. And a domain in biology is the same thing. We have life overall everything, and then right underneath it is domain. And there are three domains of life. You have eukaryota, all the eukaryotic cells, um, eubacteria, which are the true bacteria, and then archaea. And those are kind of weird little prokaryotic organisms that are very strange, and we'll talk about those in a second. And those are our three domains of life. Um, so that just kind of narrows it down to all the eukaryotic cells, all the bacteria, and all the other kind of weird prokaryotes that are out there. So you can narrow it down farther in between there, but at least you kind of know what branch you're talking about. So we have eukaryotes, their own branch of life, and then we have bacteria and archaea, the other two branches of life. So everything that's on the planet falls into one of those three categories. So, eubacteria. True bacteria, you meaning true, once again, bacteria. Um, these guys have everything about them that every single bacteria on the planet is supposed to have. They have that peptidoglycan cell wall, 70S ribosomes, they are found in normal environments. Um, if you throw a dartboard at the what is a bacteria, they're going to fall into that category. Now, archaea are very, very, very similar to bacteria, uh, to the true bacteria, the uh, eubacteria uh, domain. But they're just so slightly different in some really important ways. Now, bacteria can be found everywhere on the planet for the most part. And so can archaea. But archaea can be found in a couple of places that bacteria have a really tough time surviving in. Um, like these horrible hot springs down here. Now this is in Yellowstone National Park. Now this is called the Great Blue Hole. Um, it originally did not look like this. It was originally just a giant boiling blue hot spring. Um, and then in the 1950s somebody threw a garbage uh, dump, threw a bunch of garbage inside of it thinking, I don't have no idea, just a good place, place to get rid of it. And it introduced some kind of weird bacteria and archaic organisms into this uh, boiling hot springs. Now the archaea took over very quickly and started producing all of these strange colors that you see now from their uh, metabolism of producing sulfur and all these kind of weird places. Um, it's boiling hot, really acidic. Um, a couple of people die every year by falling in these things. It'll boil you alive, it'll melt your skin off, horrible place. Bacteria can't survive there, or don't like to if they can at all. But archaea, they have no problem with it whatsoever. Um, so the archaea that got jumped into that, uh, dumped into that hot spring from the garbage pit, um, they loved it, and they just took over there. Um, so they can live at the bottom of the ocean where it's you know, really, really, really high pressure, no oxygen, boiling uh, temperature from the vents coming out from the um, hydrothermal uh, vents down there from the bottom of the uh, center of the earth, um, pH of about you know, zero, like battery acid, and those guys just love it. Um, that is their heaven. So bacteria don't like to be found there. Uh, archaic organisms love that. 
Now, if you have to live in one of these horrible environments, you're going to have to have a couple of cellular structures and differences um, that can allow you to survive there. We would boil alive there. They can survive there. So the differences between them um, are what allow them to survive there. And that's the differences between the two groups. Um, other than the fact that they're a little tougher, their DNA doesn't break down as heat and heat. It's a little more heat stable. It's a little more stable to pH changes and things like that. They're pretty much the same organisms. But they have those big key differences that allow them to survive in those two extreme environments where bacteria don't like to survive. Uh, but you can find archaea everywhere on the planet too, just in those extra places as well. Um, that bacteria won't be found. You can find archaea on the table all the time. So then on to our eukaryotes. What is a eukaryote? Um, you meaning true, karyote meaning nucleus. So under our eukaryotes, again, are organisms with a true nucleus. So we are eukaryotes. Plants are eukaryotes. Dogs, um, fish, squirrels, yeast, fungus. Um, all that stuff, eukaryotic cells. Anything that's not a bacteria or an archaic organism is going to be eukaryote, uh, eukaryotic. Um, eukaryotic cells can be both unicellular and multicellular. Now, unicellular organisms, once again, have the capability of doing everything that they need to do by themselves. Now, multicellular organisms kind of are a little different. Um, the single cell by itself can do everything that it needs to do. It can reproduce. It can produce its own energy. But devoid of the whole, it can't function. It can't survive. It's like your liver. If you were to take your liver out of your body, your liver is going to die. But the cells that make up your liver, as long as they're inside of you and being fed by the organism as a whole, um, are going to be able to produce their own energy, um, going to be able to survive and things like that. Um, because if you take them out of you, they can't go get food. They don't have the ability to do that. Whereas a unicellular eukaryote, unicellular bacteria, they have the ability to go get their own food, to find their own food. Whereas our liver can't go do that. Um, it has to depend on the whole organism to provide the nutrients that it needs to clean waste out and things like that. Um, whereas a unicellular version can. So these guys have true membrane-bound organelles inside of them. They're going to have um, ribosomes that are a little slightly larger, um, referred to as ADS ribosomes. They're going to have mitochondria, that's essentially just a bacteria. They're going to have chloroplasts. They're going to have Golgi apparatuses. They're going to have endoplasmic reticulum. All of these classic stereotypical organelles that work and serve the cell as a, uh, as a whole um, that you learned about in grade school. Now, unlike binary fission, which is the simple just make a copy and split into two identical versions, um, eukaryotic cells are going to divide by a specialized process called mitosis and meiosis. Um, and so a different version where it creates um, an identical copy of the cell, but there's more chromosomes to deal with. Um, meiosis reduces the number of chromosomes for producing sex cells, sperm and eggs, um, to allow us to reproduce. Um, these guys are going to have chromosomes that are straight lines. Um, bacteria, prokaryotes, have round chromosomes. If they, uh, they're, they're one little bacterial chromosome. Um, it's a big blob of DNA, but it's round and connected on either end. It's a big blob that all just kind of hooks together, no nucleus, uh, but it's a big ball. Ours are straight lines. They're not connected on either ends. Um, so that's one of the big differences between these guys. Um, if a eukaryotic cell is going to have a cell wall, it's going to be made out of something different. Now, animal cells don't have cell walls, but fungus and plants do. They're eukaryotic. Um, now, in plants, the cell wall is going to be made of cellulose. If you've ever eaten a stalk of celery and those little strings that come off of that, um, that's pure cellulose. We can't digest that. Eukaryotes as a whole cannot digest cellulose. It's only broken down by bacteria, prokaryotes. Um, now, organisms like cows and deer and things that live off grass they have bacteria that live inside of their stomach that break down that cellulose for them. So the bacteria break down the cellulose, um, releasing the sugars and nutrients inside of the cellulose, and then the uh, uh, cow, the organism, can then just digest that uh, already released cellulose. Um, so without the bacteria inside of their intestines or their stomachs, those organisms would not be able to live off of grass. So very cool how that works. And um, then if you're a fungus, your cell wall is going to be made out of something called chitin, um, which is a very interesting form of sugar. Um, it also makes up the exoskeletons of insects. So if you like to eat fungus, uh, mushrooms on your uh, pizza or on your um, 
your um, Italian food or whatever, keep in mind the next time you crunch down on one, you're technically crunching down on a cockroach skeleton. No, not really, but you get the idea. It's the same chemical makeup. Um, and then, once again, just kind of overall, they're generally a whole lot bigger um, than our prokaryotes. So if you just got a microscope and that's the only way you can tell them apart, your eukaryotes are going to be a whole lot bigger um, than your prokaryotes. And then where do our protists fall? They're kind of somewhere in between. Um, they're all technically considered eukaryotes, but some of them have really primitive traits um, that might be considered prokaryotic or very, very, very primitive eukaryotic kind of thing. So technically they're eukaryotes, they all have ADS ribosomes, those membrane-bound organelles and things like that, but they do some very primitive things, so they're kind of in between. Um, they have that true membrane-bound nucleus that I mentioned, but some of them are lacking uh, mitochondria, some of them don't have chloroplasts, so they have some kind of weird things going on with them. Um, for a long time, it was kind of considered that they might be um, the ancestors to modern-day eukaryotes, kind of the stepping stone, if you like, to get where we are now. Um, and some scientists kind of believe that they might be a different version, kind of a primitive eukaryote that never just evolved or a different branch. It's kind of just up in debate. Um, but there are quite a few of them that can cause disease in humans and animals. Uh, trichomoniasis, an STD, um, giardia, uh, disease if you, uh, caused by drinking contaminated fecal wa water by uh, animal feces, um, quite a few other diseases um, that are ca caused by protists. Um, so they do cause, uh, or they are of some concern to humans. So let's go ahead and talk about how microbes were discovered as a whole. Um, how did people get to this conclusion that there are things out there that we can't see? Now, it makes sense if you think about it, that if you can't see it, it doesn't exist. Um, out of sight, out of mind, and who would think to look for something that you can't see? Who would think that there's something there, especially if you can't see it? And that was kind of the common thought for a really long time. Um, there's, if you can't see it, it's just not there. Um, there's really no need to worry about it because we can't see it. There's no need to look because there's just nothing there. Um, so for a really long time, microscopes weren't really very good. They were, they were really expensive. And people just didn't have natural curiosity to just go look for things. Um, so right around the 14, 1500s, microscopes started to become somewhat useful and people started to become somewhat curious. Um, and this guy right here, Robert Hooke, um, was kind of the very first guy to put together that natural innate curiosity and a microscope. Um, there were a couple of other people that were doing it this, uh, at the time. We'll talk about one in just a second. Um, but he was kind of the very first person to really kind of put these things together. Um, now, he just had a decent microscope. Um, and he just loved to grab things from his, the environment around him and look at them underneath the microscope. Um, he made this big book here called Micrographia um, of just things that he saw underneath the microscope. He would look at something and then draw it. Um, and some of his drawings are extremely detailed. Um, and some of them are very accurate given the fact that they were made in the 14-1500s. Um, so it's pretty neat uh, how accurate he was. Well, anyway, one of the things that he looked at um, it was kind of just a, a mundane thing. It was a piece of cork, just a piece of wine cork, and he sliced it really thin, stuck it underneath his microscope. And this is what he saw. Uh, now these are cork cells right here, the little cell walls of the plant cell. You can see the little lines. And the inside of the plant cell is gone, it's degraded. And what you're just left with is that leftover little cell wall. Now, he saw this, and he looked at it, and he didn't really know what he was looking at at all. He just kind of went, oh, Kind of neat, these little self-contained little units kind of make sense. Maybe that's the, I don't know, maybe that's the life of the, the, the plant, kind of what he thought. Um, these little self-contained little units where the plant lives. And he kind of got to thinking about this, and he had a monastery. You see a monastery here um, that was near his house that had these little tiny self-contained rooms inside of it that had everything inside of there that a monk needed to live and be happy. So he kind of got to looking at that and he goes, you know what, these little repeated units over here in these cork and these little repeated units over here in these monasteries that have everything that a, a little thing might need inside of them look very similar to one another. So I'm going to call those cells. The monastery, those are called cells, monastic cells, prison cells, same kind of idea. 
So I'm going to call these little tiny repeating units, little squares, cells. And that's where the term came from. Robert Hooke with a piece of cork. Um, so that's the discovery of cells as we know them, or at least where the term came from. So his cells are dead. Nobody at this point has seen living organisms underneath a microscope. So where does that come in? Well, in 1632, this guy right here gets the answer to that. Antony von Leeuwenhoek. Um, he was a Dutch guy, a merchant. He was not a scientist. He just kind of had a natural curiosity about him. Um, he also had a lot of money, which didn't hurt. And he was the very first person that we're aware of in history um, to ever um, look at a living organism underneath a microscope. Now, Robert Hooke just looked at dead things, um, pieces of a leaf or, you know, uh, dead flies, dead bugs and things. Um, and Robert Hooke's microscopes weren't strong enough to be able to zoom in, uh, magnify well enough to see um, that small, to see living organisms yet. Microscope technology just wasn't that good. You have to keep in mind that glass was extremely hard to make at this point and also extremely expensive. Um, so you couldn't really waste a lot of it to make microscopes just for the fun of doing it. Um, so this guy right here, Anthony von Leeuwenhoek, had enough money and enough time to play around with glass and microscopes and things like that. Um, so he got a hold of one of Robert Hooke's old microscopes and he tweaked it. Um, and you can see he has a microscope right here. Um, this is a thumb screw. You hold it right here and you hold it up to your eye. You can see over here. Um, and you look through it from the back. This is the little specimen holder right here and the light comes through uh, from the sun and you look up at the sky um, and this, the light and you can see through the little uh, glass lens here and whatever's on the tip of this little pin here is going to be magnified about 300 times. That's good enough to see um, small, uh, or should I say big, big eukaryotic cells. Um, so you can see living microbes underneath this microscope, which is a, a massive step forward in uh, science as we know it. Because up until this point, no one had ever seen living things that small. They just didn't know they existed. Um, so, in fact, his discovery was so big, Google gave him a, a thing here for his birthday. Um, now, he looked at it underneath his microscope, a drop of pond water, um, and rain water, all kinds of things he would look at, and record and draw what he saw. This is one of his drawings here that he called these little guys animacules. Um, and this is what he drew. Uh, he watched them move, he watched them feed, he watched them die. Um, and he made all these detailed notes and drawings of them, and he sent them to the Royal Society of London. Now, the Royal Society of London is kind of like National Geographic, or kind of like the science people at the time. Um, and they got his manuscript, and they opened it up, and they went, who the heck is this crazy Dutch guy writing us about these things that, that don't exist? We can't see them, so let's go get a microscope and check. There's nothing there. Their microscopes weren't that good, so they couldn't see it. Um, and he's writing to them in... in German or Dutch? We don't speak this language. Uh, and they just kind of tossed his paper aside. Nobody believed him. Um, so he kept writing and he kept writing and he kept writing. And eventually microscopes in England got good enough where they could see these animacules and they finally believed him after they proved it to themselves. And they invited him in to become a member of the Royal Society of uh, History Society of London and there goes history. Um, so on and so forth. So we took a really far step forward from there's nothing out there that's small to, hey, I can see things underneath a microscope that are living. And now we know that there are living things underneath a microscope. So now you have to ask the question, where did these living things underneath this microscope come from? Well, this is kind of the dumbest thing I've ever heard of, but let's go with it. Spontaneous generation. So in the time period, um, there was a really common thought that life could originate from non-living things. It's kind of the uh, life force, if you like, um, that just kind of permeates the existence. I'm not really sure what they had this thought with. Um, but essentially, if you throw a bag of old food in the corner... Um, it's going to grow maggots, it's going to have mice in it and things like that, especially in the 1600s, 1700s, 1500s. And people just kind of thought that maybe that non-living bag of dirty clothes or old food or whatever just gave birth to these mice, gave birth to these maggots, just kind of through the vital force of life, just kind of they were brought forth from it. Um, 
I don't understand how they didn't disprove that when they had their own babies or they watched livestock reproduce, but whatever. Um, let's just go with it. So, the first step to kind of showing where bacteria and things come from um, was to show that that idea that things just poof into existence from nothing um, is not true. So, a couple of really smart people at that time, like their heart of day, just went, no, this is goofy. This whole thing's silly. Life has to come from some other living source. There's not, you know, maggots just, just don't poof into existence. So this guy right here, Francisco Reddy, decided that he was going to disprove this theory of spontaneous generation. And he did this really elegantly. He took three jars, or nine jars if you like, one with uh, a steak, he put steaks in all of them, one with uh, that was open, one that had a piece of gauze over the top, and one that had a piece of parchment paper over it. Sorry, he took three jars. Um, and he set them out on a table just to see what would happen. Well, the open jar, as that steak rots, um, he could observe the flies coming in and out of that jar. He could observe the flies landing on the steak, laying their eggs, watching the maggots develop. And he could say, oh, those maggots came from the flies. I can show that they came from the flies because I watched this, um, and that's where they came from. And then what he did was he wanted to show that without the presence of the flies, there would be no maggots. That The maggots just don't originate from rotting flesh, rotting meat, rotting garbage. So what he did was he took that jar and he covered it with a piece of gauze. Now, if you know anything about gauze, it's not airtight. Air can still go in and out of it, but flies are too big to go through that. So as that steak rotted, the smell attracted the flies to it. The flies landed on top of the gauze, laid their eggs. The eggs didn't fall through the gauze. The maggots developed on top of the gauze. The steak was never impacted by the flies or the maggots, but the maggots still showed up. So obviously the flies brought the maggots in. And then he took it a step farther, and he sealed that jar with waxed parchment paper to keep the air out, so no smell can be released. Um, so as it sat there, it sat there, and the steak rots or starts to rot, no smell is released, it's kept all inside the jar. The flies never detect it, they never show up, no maggots are ever deposited anywhere near that steak. So if the maggots just poofed out of the steak, they should show up regardless of if the flies are there or not. Um, so this experiment kind of showed that life just doesn't poof into existence um, without the help of another living organism. Now the problem with this experiment is that when he traps air inside of a jar, there's mold spores and fungal spores and things that people didn't really understand where they came from yet still in that jar. So while the steak didn't get eaten by the maggots, it still developed fungus, it still got mold on it, and it still rotted even though it was close to the air. And while, why it did that is because all of the fungus and nastiness in the air just got on the steak, but these guys didn't know that. So we went from, oh hey, life comes from nothing, to, well, okay, big life has to be brought about from other living organisms like flies and us and things like that. Ma uh, maggots and rats and things just don't poof out of, of dirty clothes and dirty food. But, since those bacteria and tiny other little things still poofed into existence um, from that closed jar, they have to come from nothing. So we went from the idea of spontaneous generation for all life to spontaneous microbial generation. That microbes and tiny little bacteria and things like that still poof into existence um, from nothing, simply because... Um, that experiment was still had air inside of it. He didn't sterilize the air. Um, so, a couple of smart people really instantly went, no, this is silly. Um, bacteria and other little tiny living organisms out there, we know they exist. Where do they come from? It makes perfect sense that they come from other living organisms as well. We need to be able to prove that. They just don't poof into existence from the air. So how do we do that? Well, they were on the right idea with getting the keeping the air out but the problem is you have to clean stuff inside if the bacteria is in there to start with even if you seal out the air they're still going to get in there so people started sealing off jars boiling jars to kill the stuff inside of it um, and when they figured out that they could boil things to kill them to sterilize it um, it worked so you boil it stuff doesn't grow stuff doesn't grow but if you don't cork it or you leave it open to the air stuff's going to fall back inside of it. 
So they still had some problems with this experiment. It still looks like it's coming from the air. It still looks like it's poofing into existence. They didn't know that bacteria and mold spores and things just floated around in the air. They didn't understand that part yet. Couldn't see them. So they started to get a little farther forward by corking their bottles, boiling the bottle um, with a cork inside of it, which would kill everything inside the bottle, leaving it corked, and then it would stay sealed. So if you cracked it, the stuff would come inside. So as long as you didn't crack the bottle, it would stay sealed, which would make sure that it stayed clean and stayed sterile and that nothing would grow. So they were getting on to the idea that there's a connection between keeping things free from the air and keeping them clean on the inside and stuff not growing. So they're getting to the idea that maybe stuff's in the air. If you can keep the air out, you keep things from getting, uh, getting dirty, getting sick. Um, and this kind of led to the idea of malaise. If you've ever heard that term, it's French for bad air. Um, so these plague doctors and things, you know, they uh, put those big masks on that were filled with uh, um, smelly things to keep the bad air away. And this was kind of that idea. It came way prior to this. Um, but this is just kind of kind of helped to get rid of that idea that it was the air that was causing you to get sick by capping it, keeping the air out kind of thing. And then finally, Louis Pasteur showed up um, and saved the whole world from this silly idea. Um, so Louis Pasteur was a French scientist who lived in the 1800s, did tons of, tons of important things. Um, he developed vaccines for anthrax, cholera, rabies. He was the very first person to propose the existence of viruses, which is kind of cool. Um, so he discovered alcoholic fermentation, which is kind of neat. Um, and he's the very first person to kind of put together this ridiculous idea, uh, to put to bed, excuse me, this idea of spontaneous microbial generation. That microbes and tiny little things just poof into existence from the air. So how did he do this? Pretty cool. Well, what he did was he took these special little swan neck flask here. Now, as you can see, um, this little thing here, it's a giant hollow glass straw. These were very expensive to make in the 1800s, so he had a lot of money or a lot of funding. Um, big hollow ball here filled with chicken broth. Um, or vegetable broth, that's what we use to grow microbes, and a big giant hollow glass straw that's open to the air. So the key to his experiment was to show that there, as long as you keep the bacteria, you can keep stuff open to the air, but as long as you keep it clean and keep the bacteria out, that it won't go bad. So he's trying to prove a link between the air with the bacteria in it and going bad. So the very first thing he did was he took a, a, a essentially a toilet paper tube and he filled it full of cotton and he did this and he pulled a bunch of air through it and he looked at that cotton swab filter underneath the microscope and he saw tons of little mold spores and little tiny things and he drew them around and he made some notes about it and he put together this idea that maybe this stuff is in the air maybe that's where this is coming from so we developed these bottles to prove that if you can keep stuff open to the air, but keep the bacteria out, that it's not the air that's causing them to get sick, it's the stuff that's in the air. And this is what he did here. So his little glass ball uh, here, this swan neck flask, or big giant hollow tube, big giant hollow straw, that's open to the air over here. Now the force of air will allow the air to travel up the tube, um, but not anything heavier than air. The air can't push heavy things up the high. It's kind of the roller coaster concept. Once you go up the big high hill, you can never go as up uh, high as you went up again without another thing to pull you up to the other side. So the air pressure can't push heavy bacteria, heavy viruses, heavy mold spores up this uh, hill here to get inside of this uh, this flask. So what he did was he took his broth and he boiled it. And that sterilized everything. They knew this at that point. Um, but they, So he wanted to show that if he can leave something open to the air um, and it still not go bad. And he wanted to show that it wasn't the air, it was the stuff in the air. So what he did was he boiled that thing until it was totally sterile. And then he let it just sit there. He let it cool down and he let it sit. And he let it sit and he let it sit for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. And eventually what started to happen was in the lowest point of the neck, right here, a little small blob of dirt and dust started to collect um, inside of that bottle. Now, the broth never went bad, ever, um, but the dust and stuff just started to collect inside of that sample. 
Now, what Louis Pasteur did, well, he had a bunch of these flasks, is he broke one of them off right about here. And he took a sample of that dust and stuff, and he put it underneath his microscope, and he looked at it. And it looked exactly like the stuff that came out of the air. So he started to put together this idea that there was stuff in the air um, that was causing stuff to go bad, that could make things to get spoiled, that maybe that's what's making you sick. And then he took it a step farther and he took another one of this flask and he tilted it sideways, like here, like this. And he let the liquid run up that straw and touch that nasty broth. And he tilted it right back, or that nasty dust, and he uh, let it sit, uh, go right back up and he let it incubate. And then a couple of hours later, that broth that had been sitting there for open to the air for months on end was instantaneously uh, contaminated, instantaneously nasty. Um, just because he let it touch the collected microbes in there. So this is what kind of showed that microbes are coming from the air They're, or from some source. They don't just poof um, into existence from this type of broth. They're not just in the broth. They're not just in, bacteria, uh, in rotting garbage. They come in from something else. Um, and this is what his uh, experiment showed. Now, unfortunately for Louis Pasteur, there's two types of broths out there that are used commonly in microbiology world. There's vegetable broth and beef broth. Vegetable broth you make by boiling wheat and boiling grains and things um, and collecting all the proteins out of them. Vegetable uh, uh, Beef broth, chicken broth, is the same thing. You just boil the bones or the meat and get the proteins out of it. Now, the difference, they work pretty much the exact same. But the difference between the two is that beef broth you can sterilize. Chicken broth, animal broth, you can sterilize. Um, vegetable broth, uh, plant-based broth, not so much. We can nowadays. It's very easy to today. But in Louis Pasteur's time, it was not. Now, Louis Pasteur just happened to have chosen to use beef broth for his experiment. Very, very, very easy to sterilize. Would stay sterile as long as it needed to be. Now... When Louis Pasteur published his results and told everybody that this experiment worked, everybody on the planet wanted to replicate it to show, yeah, it does work. That's kind of the definition point of science, to make sure that it does work. To, uh, publish your results, everybody else can copy it, show that it works. Well, when people started to replicate Louis Pasteur's experiment, they got about 50-50% mixed results. Well, it turns out they didn't know the difference, or that there was a difference between bacteria made, or, uh, broth made from vegetables and broth made from beef, because they were missing the knowledge that there's a crucial piece of existence out there called an endospore. Now, bacteria, when the environment goes bad, um, they run out of food, they get too cold, they get too hot, um, things like that, they get too dry. Some species of bacteria can form something called an endospore. And that's essentially just a giant bomb-proof, bulletproof, bulletproof vest um, that bacteria can wear, and they essentially are immune to freezing, to burning, to, or to boiling, excuse me, um, to chemicals, to pretty much everything. You have to kill them by fire, or uh, pressure and heat. Um, just anything that naturally is going to occur to them, they're not going to die in. And this is to ensure that once the environment goes bad, that that organism can survive for millions and millions of years until the environment gets good again, and then that little endospore can wake back up and start over again. Now, vegetable broths, endospores are all over them. They live in the dirt, they live on plants, all over the place. Not very common in animals. So, Louis Pasteur's beef broth was very easy to sterilize. This vegetable broth, you boil it and boil it and boil it, you kill all the living bacteria inside of it, but the endospores are totally, totally fine. They don't care. Um, boiling does not bother them. So, you let it cool down, all the living bacteria were dead, and then four or five days later, the endospores go, hey, look, we got lots of food, and they wake up and recontaminate the broth again. So even though it looks like it was sterile, the, uh, it wasn't. So what was happening was people were using those endospore, the vegetable-based broth, having endospore problems, and then saying that Louis Pasteur's experiment didn't work. They just didn't know that those endospores existed. Well, fast forward a little while later, um... This guy right here, John Tyndall, comes forth and says, hey, maybe there's something out there to explain this. He realized that if you boil one for a longer time than another, 
that one of them's never going to become sterile, even though it's been boiled for pretty much as long as existence. It'll never become sterile because those endospores aren't going to die. So they didn't know what endospores were yet, but he figured out that no matter how long you're going to boil it, it's never going to get sterile. So he proposed that there was something in this broth that could survive this process of boiling. Um, so that kind of put them on the right idea as well. And then this guy right here, uh, Ferdinand Cohen, actually found those little endospores in 1876. He found them. He found them in his samples. He was able to show if he removed them from the vegetable broth. Um, he figured out how to properly kill them. Um, and once you remove them from the vegetable-based broth, you can leave it open to the uh, atmosphere forever, and it would never go bad. And this is finally what replaced that idea of spontaneous microbial generation with the theory of biogenesis, that life has to come from other living organisms. It took until 1876 with the discovery of endospores, heat-resistant bacteria that can survive boiling, to abandon the idea that life came from non-life completely. That's less than about 200 years ago, and that's kind of sad to me, but okay. Um, so, it took a really long time to figure that out. Well, another little side note here, uh, there is a couple of, or there is a bottle of Louis Pasteur's original sample sitting in the Louvre Museum that's still sterile. That's kind of cool to me. Um, so, it took a really long time to get rid of all these silly ideas of where microbiology, uh, where microbes come from, how they're brought about into existence, and all this stuff. But finally, once we got rid of it, um, we were able to make some really strong advancements in the field of microbiology um, and things like that. So, the history of microbiology kind of really started um, in about 1875. Um, right after we got rid of that theory of spontaneous microbial generation, right after people started to become intelligent. Um, and then we entered into about a 50-year period um, called the Golden Age of Microbiology. Um, and that's when people started to really dig into what bacteria are, how they function, um, what disease is caused by what organism, how diseases are transmitted around, and they even started to work on viruses at this point, which is pretty cool, um, given the fact that they really didn't even have a really good understanding of what bacteria were at that point. Um, so, let's go ahead and get into that. So, um, it's pretty cool that you can look at all those successes in the early fields of microbiology and you can round all of that up to modern day successes where we've been able to eradicate diseases such as smallpox, um, polio, uh, cholera in this country that used to kill hundreds of millions of people um, across the world. We've eradicated these kinds of diseases um, to the point where they're no longer threats to at least this country's populations and smallpox to the world. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, thanks to those guys before um, and that their work on that early discovery of viruses, early bacteria work and things like that, um, we were able to fast forward and figure out how to combat these diseases that were really dangerous for a really long time. Um, well, it doesn't really seem like there's much left for bacteria uh, and microbes and viruses and things for people to discover um, since you know, we kind of know what causes a lot of diseases. There are thousands of new viruses out there, one we're dealing with now, um, that could potentially cause a threat to, pro to, to humanity in the future or, or agriculture or, or anything like that in the future. Um, Bioremediation, like I mentioned earlier, using bacteria and different types of organisms to clean up oil spills. Um, chemical runoffs. Uh, agricultural waste products. No telling. Um, bioweapons, uh, combating those, there's no telling what the future of microbiology is going to have for it. Um, so very, very, very interesting um, things to come for microbiology. So let's go ahead and talk about um, kind of really what is microbiology, kind of how we deal with microbes, kind of what a cell is, some of those things like that. So um, these two guys right here, Schleiden and Schwann, they're two German guys, and they kind of took together all of the information that had been discovered by people like Louis Pasteur, Ferdinand Cohen, about um, how life kind of came around into existence, how cells make 
energy and things like that um and all this stuff um so they kind of put together all of this information um into one kind of succinct little idea of what to study as a, as, a, as a microbiologist or a biologist or kind of what a cell is kind of what is a cell how do we look at a cell how do we define what a cell is what are the traits of a cell um, so these are the guys that brought this about so i mentioned earlier cells are kind of the most simplistic um forms of life they can do every single thing that a living organism can do so how do we define what a cell is well, every single cell on the planet, regardless of if you're prokaryotic or eukaryotic, is going to fall into these categories. You will have these traits um, as a cell. If you are a cell, you will do all of these things. If you are not a cell, you cannot do them. You might be able to do four or three or two or maybe five of them, but not all of them. So only cells can do all of these things. So... How do we define what a cell is? Well, every living cell on the planet um, came from one uh, previously existing cell. Um, cells arise from pre-existing cells via cellular division. Now that brings about the question of where the first cell come from. Either nature broke its own laws or some supernatural entity broke the law for us, so either one of those is perfectly fine with me. Um, all living things are made up of at least one or more cells, and that makes sense. If you're a living organism, you have to have a cell. Um, viruses don't have a cell, so therefore they aren't alive. And the cell is the fundamental unit of structure and function in the living organism. It's kind of like saying a brick wall is made up of bricks. A brick is the fundamental unit of structure for a brick wall. Without the bricks, there would be no brick wall. Without the cells to make me up, there would be no me. The cells are the structures that make me up. Now, those first three things there were the original cell theory that Schleiden and Schwann put forth in 1838. Um, they didn't understand metabolism yet. They didn't even know what DNA was. Um, they had no idea how to look at these cells underneath microscopes and analyze the chemical compositions. Um, so the rest of these four were added later on um, as science advanced and more discoveries were made. Now, the fourth one, the activity of the organism depends on the total activity of the independent cells. Makes perfect sense if you think about it. I'm made up of 100% cells. I can do 100% of my daily activities. If 50% of my cells are damaged, I can only do 50% of my regular activities because they just aren't working as well as they should. So that's how that one works. Pretty easy on that. Cells are the only thing that are capable of making ATP, cellular energy via metabolism or photosynthesis. Nothing else on the planet can make cellular energy, ATP. So cells are the only thing that can do that. And every single cell on the planet is going to contain both DNA and RNA as their genetic material. And that's a key characteristic between viruses and cells. Viruses contain one or the other, not both. So all living cells must contain both DNA and RNA. And this also makes sense if you think about it. Pretty much all similarly related species are going to have similar cells. And that makes perfect sense if you think about it. A dog from a cell from a dog and a cell from a fox, they're pretty much going to be the identical cells. Whereas a cell from me and a cell from an E. coli are going to be pretty different. Um, but it makes sense if you think about it. And that's just evolutionarily speaking. They're closely related to one another, very similar um, ancestor, so their cells are going to be very similar. So let's go ahead and talk about one of the other big advancements in the uh, theory of microbiology. And this is a guy named Robert Koch. He put this forth. Um, the germ theory of disease. Now, up until uh, uh, pretty much 1870 or some odd, um, people thought you could get sick from a curse or, you know, somebody didn't like you, had bad luck, or maybe God was frowning upon you, or you got some, you breathed in some bad air, maybe you drank some bad water or something like that. Um, and this guy right here, Robert Koch, wanted to show that some diseases, not all of them, um, could be caused by tiny little living microorganisms, um, he wanted to show that these bacteria were what were actually causing certain diseases um, in humanity. And he wanted to show that now that we knew they were out there, we knew they didn't come from nothing, 
Um, he wanted to show that they were actually able and what were going to be causing the diseases of the day. So he came up with some very interesting uh, sets of uh, steps that you follow to figure out if a brand new organism that you've identified or you think is causing a disease um, is actually the one that's causing that disease. So these are called postulates, Koch's postulates. Um, they're still used today. Um, this is what they are. So I'm going to talk about them really shortly. So let's pretend you have a population of cows. And in your population of cows, you have a disease that's running rampant that you've never seen before. So you, as a microbiologist, or Robert Koch, um, you're going to go figure out what bacteria is causing this disease so you can treat it. You've never seen it before. You want to be able to identify it and treat it in future cows. So the very first thing you're going to do is you're going to go out and you're going to look at your population of cows and you're going to note the symptoms on the organisms. The cows all have a runny nose, they all have uh, you know, red eyes, and their coat doesn't look very healthy. Um, so you are going to note that, and then you're going to take a sample um, from the cows. So you're going to go back into a lab and you're going to grow those samples up. And what's going to happen is you, as a microbiologist, should see um, all the cows that you noted as sick should have the same symptoms, and all the cows that were healthy should have no symptoms. And then what you're going to do is you're going to grow those cultures up and look at them. Um, if you have a healthy cow that has no symptoms and a diseased cow that has symptoms, the plates and cultures that you get should have a couple of differences in between them. Now, they're going to have a couple of similarities. Every single cow on the planet is going to have the same bacteria growing on them for the most part. Um, but there are going to be a couple of differences, and hopefully that difference is one of those organisms um, is the one that's causing the sickness in that cow. So what your job would be is to find all the sick cows, look at all their plates, and find out which organisms they all have in common. So if cow A is sick and cow B is sick, but they don't share the same bacteria in common, it's not one of those. But if cow A and B are sick and C are sick and D are sick and they all share the same bacteria in common that's not found in the healthy cows, that's probably your culprit. So what you do is you collect a little sample from those diseased animals of that similar bacteria and you grow it up in a pure culture plate off to the side in a new, uh, co new colony here. And you can see that right here. Um, and then what you do is you take that pure culture plate and you introduce some of that bacteria into a brand new organism, usually a mouse in this case. Um, and then that mouse is going to develop symptoms. Um, hopefully it develops the red runny eyes, uh, not a very good looking coat, the same symptoms that you saw in your previous uh, population of cows. So the mouse develops the same sick symptoms, the same disease. And then what you need to do is you need to remove a tissue sample um, from that mouse that you've infected um, and then re-isolate out the same organism that you put into it. So what you've done is you've shown that this organism up here, this uh, rod little black bacteria, is only found in sick organisms and not in healthy animals. They don't have it. So the healthy animals, if they had it, they would be sick. These guys have it. It's what's making them sick, probably. So you take a sample from the sick rat, you grow it up in a lab, and then you take these little black bacteria that you grew up here and you inject it into a brand new mouse. That brand new mouse gets sick and gets uh, and eventually will die. And then you take another sample. You see the little black bacteria growing again. You didn't see them in the healthy animal. You saw them up here and when, you, when it was sick, that's the same bacteria you put into the diseased animal. And then you isolate it out again. And that's how you prove that this organism this little black uh, rod bacteria, by these steps here, you took it from the sick organism, you isolated it out, you infected a new organism, you uh, same symptoms developed, you re-isolated that organism, and were able to grow it up in a pure culture again from a previously healthy organism that you introduced it to and the same symptoms developed. So this is how you link a bacteria that uh, no one's ever put the disease, figure out what disease it caused, um, how you link a bacteria to a disease that it causes. And these are Koch's postulates, a little four-step process of linking a brand new bacteria to the disease that it causes. 
Um, now, he did this a bunch, anthrax, cholera, a couple of other diseases um, that he linked this concept to. Um, and these postulates are still used today um, for brand new organisms, how to identify them and things like that. So super cool. And now these are the word forms um, of what I just talked about as well, if you want to check those out. So the last little bit we're going to talk about here um, is how do we name the microbiological world? Um, scientists as a whole use something called the binomial system of nomenclature, or two names, that's what that means, um, to identify a species uh, or an organism that they're talking about. Now, this seems kind of silly. Why don't we just say things like E. coli or bacteria or salmonella um, and things like that? So let's go over these real fast. What I have on the screen are a couple of animals for you guys to look at. Um, this is an American robin, and this is also a robin. It is a European robin, however. So if I'm going to go to England and give a speech over robins, and I don't specify which kind of robin I'm talking about, I as an American are going to be talking about this, but they as a European are going to be thinking this guy. These two things are only related to about the extent that they're birds, and that's really about all they've got in common. Um, this is a killer whale. He is not a whale. He is an orca. What is an orca? That doesn't tell me anything. Technically, he's a porpoise. He's more related to dolphins than whales, but neither of his common names tell me anything. Um, buttercups, daffodils. Okay, cool. That's useful. Now, which one are you talking about? I don't know. And this could be anything from a crawfish, a craw crawdad, a, cr a crayfish, a yabby if you live in Australia, um, mud bugs. So, all kinds of colloquial names for different types of organisms. So, as a scientist, this gets really confusing. I'm going to give a speech today about robins. Okay, which type of robin? I'm going to give a speech today about yabbies. Well, if you're not Australian, you don't know what a yabby is. So, common names get really confusing. Um, so, scientists come up with really common, a really standardized way, I should say, um, of naming organisms to make sure that these things don't get into a prop, uh, get into to issues here. So if I go to Europe and I'm going to talk about an, a robin, I'm going to say, I'm going to speak to you about Turtus migratoris today. Here's the scientific names of those. Um, so the Brits don't think that I'm talking about Erythrica rubellica, um, the European robin. They'll know that I'm going to be speaking about a different species. So these scientific names, the way that we write scientific names and things, um, really do matter. And it's not just because, you know, common names get confusing. It also helps if you don't speak the same language. If you don't speak Russian, I don't speak Russian, so if someone spoke to me in Russian, I would only get Turtus migratoris out of their conversation and know that they were talking about a robin. So at least I got something. Um, but that helps with being able to communicate when language barriers come into, uh, come into play um, and things like that. And also you've got to remember, common names are confusing. Um, a cheesecake's not a cake, it's technically a pie. Um, so that gets real fun when you just start calling things random things. Um, so just because it's called a whale doesn't make it a whale. Um, so scientific names get confusing. So scientists have these specialized way of naming things um, called binomial nomenclature. And how you write these things out is super easy. Um, this is the s specific way um, of writing bacterial names here. So, how you do this properly, of every single species on the planet, you'll see I did this here, um, they're written like this, so two words, Narcissus jonquila. Um, the genus, the first letter of the genus, is going to be capitalized. The second, uh, the first letter of the species, genus and species, um, is going to be lowercase. So, uppercase genus, lowercase species, and if you're writing them out, it's going to be either italicized, or underlined. Now, either one of them is perfectly fine. It does not matter. And this seems super trivial. I absolutely understand. But there is a reason for this. Um, there are so many bacteria out there that their diseases share the same name as the species. So if I say, oh, you've got salmonella. Well, if you don't, if you're writing that out and you're just reading it, if it's not italicized or underlined, it's just written the word salmonella. Do you have salmonella sickness? Are you sick with salmonella? Or do you actually just have a handful of bacteria in your hand? So which one is it? Well, special, uh, writing like that allows you to actually tell which one it is. 
Um, there's a shape of bacteria called a bacillus that's also a species of bacteria. So which one am I talking about? Um, Falco is a rock singer, an Austrian singer from the 80s that sang Rock Me Amadeus um, and Der Commissar. But if I italicize the word Falco, I'm now talking about the genus of falcons and birds and uh, things like that. So italicizing and underlining really does matter. It seems really trivial. I absolutely understand. Um, but it really does matter, especially when you're reading or writing um, species names so your uh, reader gets what you're actually trying to convey across. Um, and it's also very common in the microbiological world to see microbes with their names um, abbreviated. Um, so Escherichia coli, E. coli, Salmonella typhurium, S. typhurium, R. rickettsia, rickettsia rickettsii, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Um, but when you abbreviate things, it can get really confusing. Um, S. typhurium, well, there's Salmonella, Serratia, Shigella, Staph, Strep. So what S are you talking about? Um, if you don't know, I don't know. So make sure that you know if you do decide to abbreviate which one you're actually talking about. Um, so you can do that, but it gets into a, a sketchy space if you end up with things like S's. There's lots of R's as well. Um, so keep that in mind. So let's finish up here. Um, with a couple of terms that are really common in the microbiology world um, that we'll see in this course that you might hear um, in the real world um, and what they mean. So we've already talked about what a microbe is. It's just something that you can't see with your naked eye. It's just too small. Um, and then the next term that we'll deal with um, is something uh, as an infection. Um, so an infection is going to be the presence of another living organism in or on a host. Um, if you live in or on another organism, you might not necessarily be causing an, a problem. You're just there. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're sick. Um, you just have something living in or on you. Um, signs are going to be something that you as a healthcare practitioner are going to directly observe from your patient. Um, they come in and they say, oh, uh, I'm sick. Okay, cool. Those are symptoms. Something that they tell you. My tummy hurts. My arm hurts. But signs are going to be things like their fever that you physically can observe, or their eyes are dilated, or they have jaundice and things like that. Um, an inoculation is going to be an introducing a brand new microbial sample into an environment where it hasn't previously been before, either an inoculation by a shot or you can inoculate a petri dish and things like that. Um, a disease is going to be when an infection crosses over to causing tissue damage. And that tissue damage is not caused by a physical injury. It's caused by a root cause, like a microbe or something that we can physically point, uh, pinpoint to. Septicemia is going to be blood poisoning by bacteria or their toxins. So you've got um, some sort of bacteria moving around inside of your blood or their toxins that the bacteria produce that are causing you some kind of physical pain, physical problem. Um, and then bacteremia can be the, just the physical presence of bacteria in the blood. Not always a bad thing, usually is, but not guaranteed of being bad. And our last little two terms, three terms here, four terms, are going to be a parasite, um, an organism that lives in or on another organism and feeds off that other organism at harm, at a, 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 a cause uh, of harm to them. And a pathogen is going to be a microbe that does harm. You can have an obligate pathogen, which is guaranteed to do harm, and an opportunistic pathogen, which might. Um, normal flora, going to be bacteria that live in or on you that don't cause any problems for the most part. Um, they're supposed to be there. They're normal. Um, and then an opportunistic infection is going to be when one of those normal flora organisms crosses over to causing problems in us. And we'll talk about how that works later. So um, that's all I've really got for you guys on this chapter. Um, if you have anything else, feel free to reach out and ask me a question or send me an email. Other than that, have a nice rest of your day.